all good, man. That's a that's perfectly fine to go ahead and use I that tried. as a reference. You tried. You tried. You need to prepare better next time, buddy. All that's, right. that's all you got to yeah. next, next, There won't be a next time, unfortunately, but I, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> all right. How about you, Aaron? How's my Canuck friend doing? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm, no. yeah, it's, it's kind of gloomy today. It's raining. Um, oh. In Toronto, but what good advice? Well, you know, you're a Torontonian. You, you deserve the gloom. As a Montreal, <laughs> I'm saying that. I'm just saying that for Montreal. <laughs> How are you, Hank? Where are you based out of? Uh, I'm based in Bay Area, and uh, the landmark is behind me, the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, we have a sunny day today. Cool, cool. Well, then, since we're talking about landmarks, Yi Feng, I, I guess you're based out of uh, Iceland? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm based on Bay Area, so yeah. Just put a Broca. random picture there. Yeah. No, it's all good, man. It's all good. And how are you, Fish? Where are you based, buddy? I'm also in San Francisco, down by Dolores Park. It's looking like it might be a nice day today. Okay, that's good. That's good. Hey, Karen, where are you based out of? I'm based out of Oakland. So probably Craig and I have not discussed this yet, but I bet we're we're pretty close. I'm in North Oakland, so uh, quite close to Pixar wow. Studios, actually, as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That that is that is very very yeah. close. <laughs> so to, to to we apologize to all you folks uh, that basically there's a very very west coast bent here. <laughs> to put it rather lightly, <laughs> except for our friend uh, uh, Aaron, who's based out of Toronto. So you know, but you know, so it is what it is. Doug is from Mobile, Alabama, and it's, and it's this is his third session. Thank you, uh, Doug. Bro. Glad you're here. This is awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I feel I've done a, a few polls and I, I think we, we usually have a lot of new folks. So I'm curious if you want to chime in the chat, I'd love to hear if this is your first session or if you've joined us before. Um, this is the fourth part in this four part series. So uh, like to see who's joined us previously. Uh, so we're live on LinkedIn and YouTube. So hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, I just have a few intro slides. I think everything everything is all set up. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll we'll get started here. All right. So thanks everyone for joining us. This is the Data and AI Online Meetup, a tech talk series with Salesforce Engineering. And this is the fourth and final part of this four part series. Uh, today, the team is going to be talking about continuous integration and continuous delivery with Delta Lake. So I wanted to do a quick call out for our data and AI online meetup. There's the link there and I'll drop that in the chat spaces, but I'd love for you to join us there. Uh, we announced all of our upcoming tech talks. They're all live and recorded and hosted on our YouTube channel. Uh, so we have a lot of awesome sessions. Uh, we have Summit coming up. We have a bunch of great meetups uh, in, in conjunction with our Summit. Uh, so we announce all of those on our meetup page. So we have all of our details and you can check that out and join us in Zoom if you'd like um, for future events. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, we have tons of content in there. All the video recordings from our live tech talks are in there. Um, I'll also drop the chat to this series uh, so you can revisit parts one through three if you'd like. Uh, and then join us on LinkedIn if you'd like, uh, follow us there. So I wanna do a quick shout out for Summit. We're all super excited. It's coming up coming up quick. It's May 24th through the 28th. It's over, we're gonna have over 200, <clears throat> excuse me, over 200 sessions, um, lots of awesome content. Uh, three, maybe four uh, meetups, live meetups. And we have lots of uh, lightning talks from the community. We have some amazing keynote speakers, including Matei and Ali and Malala and Renault, like lots of great speakers. And uh, we have two days of training as well. So um, I know as part of the meetup community, we have a few training discounts. So uh, uh, maybe reach out to me and I can pass one of those along for, for our viewers. Uh, so I hope you register for today. The conference is free. Um, the training is a, is a small fee, but the, all the content is um, free. So we'll hope you, you will join us there. And with that, uh, just a quick reminder that this session is recorded. I'll drop the link to the recording in all the chat spaces. So you can uh, visit us at a later date if you'd like to. 
And with that, I'll pass it to our moderators, Craig and team. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Uh, cool. So uh, to introduce myself briefly, uh, my name is Craig. I'm a solutions architect at Databricks, and I'll be moderating this, uh, this talk along with uh, Denny and, and Chris. Um, so uh, I think to start off, we'd like to do some introductions with the Salesforce team. Uh, and so I'll have them introduce themselves in turn. Um, Heng, do you want to go first? Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Hen, and uh, I'm a backend engineer at Salesforce, and uh, I'm passionate about uh, microservices, big data, and uh, distributed systems. Awesome. Thanks. Aaron, do you want to go next? Hi, everyone. I'm Aaron. Uh, I'm an engineer on uh, that works with uh, Hang and, and team on Salesforce. Pretty much the same interest, you know, big, big data, scalable solutions, microservices, and uh, I'll be co-presenting with Hang today. He'll go first and I'll cover the latest sessions. Awesome. Uh, Leo, you want to finish up? Yep. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Leo. I'm software engineer uh, working in the same thing with Hang and share the same inches, I guess. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, I will be the panelist to answer questions. Awesome, thanks. So uh, before I hang it over, hand it over to Hang and Aaron, um, if you have any questions, uh, regardless of where you're watching, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, or Zoom, uh, please feel free to uh, put questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll be either answering them directly or collating them to, uh, to answer um, after we have the presentation. Cool, uh, Hang, do you wanna get started? Sure, let me share my screen. Okay, you see my screen? Cool. Yep, looks good. Okay, uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome to our final session of uh, engagement activity Delta Lake talk series. And Aaron and I will co-present uh, today uh, about our continuous integration and continuous delivery with Delta Lake on Databricks. As usual, we want to introduce ourselves, uh, who we are and what we do. At Salesforce, we build and maintain a platform to capture custom activities like uh, emails, meetings, and videos. These events are either consumed by downstream products in real time or stored in our data lake using Delta Lake. So this data lake suppose, supports the creation of up-to-date dashboards by downstream components like Einstein Analytics and the training of machine learning models for our customers who are using Sales Cloud Einstein. In our last three talks, we share and show how we build a high performance mutable data lake using Delta Lake. Specifically, we use a multiple independent stream process to support engagement at uh, data lifecycle to satisfy the SLA. And we use the notification table to support the incremental read for our downstreams. So to achieve a high throughput transactions in engagement ID mutation, we optimize at both application layer and the data layer. So in application layer, we use graph to detect cascading ID mutation. And in the data layer, we partition our table by org ID and Z order by engagement date in order to have our data evenly distributed across reasonably sized files. And we also leverage data skipping and the Z order for IO pruning. We also want to maintain a high data consistency and the integrity. Then we create, uh, then we come up with two designs. One is the exact ones, exact ones right across tables. And the second is the global synchronization and ordering. So with the other uh, design in places, we have successfully built the data lake for multi-type of our um, sales activities, such as engagements, voice insights, email and meetings. So in today's agenda, we will start with the assumptions and requirements that our CICD build with. And then we will touch a bit, a little about the Databricks integration, about the Databricks API, COI, and the jobs. Then we will focus on the continuous deployments from simple deployment to namespace deployment. Then we will focus on the uh, continuous integration, specifically, specifically the um, scenario-based testing. And Aaron will discuss uh, security and access control. So our Delta Lake uh, is run on Databricks as a platform, uh, VPC. And uh, we are a team of data engineering. So 90% of our code are Scala and 10% of the code is notebook. 
for automation and testing purpose. And our CICD primary focus on the deployments and the integration testing. And we want to be metadata driven and can be run anywhere in a consistent way. So it can be run by developers locally on the laptop or can be hooked into a traditional automation tools like Team City uh, Jenkins, or can be integrated into the more cloud native um, deployment tools like a Spinnaker. As we run our data Delta Lake on Databricks, so we have to integrate with it. Databricks provide a rich set of uh, APIs for us to do it. So in the green box, those APIs are commonly used by us. The cluster API allows us to do crude operations on clusters and the DBFS API allowed us to upload files, uh, copy, delete files in DBFS. So by DBFS, we mean the Databricks file system, which is an abstraction on top of a object storage like S3 or HDBFS. And uh, with jobs API, we can do the crude operations on jobs. When you work with Databricks in a platform, you have to, uh, everything is a job. So a job is a run unit and a job has a metadata like a name, or ID or timestamp. A job has to uh, attach to a cluster. In AWS, a cluster is auto scaling group and a job can be scheduled. The Databricks provide a simple Chrome like scheduler for us to schedule our jobs. And you can also view the job run histories. When you create a job, you can select uh, uh, three type of the tasks. If you want to run a notebook, you choose a notebook and you can also run a job through a assembled jar. And you also can run a job with a, a configured Spark uh, submit. Uh, if you run the job with a jar, then you have to upload your assembled jar to the DBFS first then provide the parameters of the main class, the arguments of the um, main class and uh, set up the cluster. So in the, in the, in the configure cluster page, you can uh, provide very detailed cluster configurations uh, such as the Databricks runtime with the version of Scala and the Spark. And you can set the um, cluster size and the worker type and the driver type this may be, this may vary across the different cloud providers, um, but will look similar. And you can also further provide uh, more customized configura configurations like availability zoom, the uh, EBS volumes and Spark configuration, tax, SSH, log logging and in initial scripts. And fortunately, you can put all the configurations in one JSON file. We call it job definition JSON. So in the new cluster section, you put all the configuration related to cluster. And you can also set the scheduler and the Spark job task and uh, the libraries you want to use. So this capability allowed us to make our CICD metadata driven very easily. So this is an example of the job definitions. And then we put into the engagement projects. For the simple deployments, uh, there are primary two steps. One is to create the job entry on Databricks using create job API and uh, upload the sampled jar to the DBFS using DBFS put API. And we encapsulate all the dependencies and the complexities in a Docker image. So when we want to do a simple deployment, we just create a container out of it by providing a couple of parameters. So the APP path volume tells the CICD well to find the sample jars and the Databricks jobs tells well to find those job definitions and Databricks notebooks tells well to find those notebooks files. And you provide the deploying environment, could be a dev, could be a staging or production and provide the Databricks host and token to talk to the actual Databricks service and the specify the project names. This Docker uh, container can be run locally by developers if, if they want to do, do, deploy, uh, do a deployment from a local laptop or can be hooked into uh, the existing CI/CD pipelines. For us, we use the team CD, but, or, but both will share, uh, will share similar steps. So in the team city, we first pull the uh, code from the GitHub 
and use the SBT to create the sampled jars and put the images to do the deployments. So inside the containers, we first deploy the jar to um, DBFS and run the integration tests, which we will touch uh, later. And then run the deployment script, job script to um, create the job entries and run APPs. So the simple deployment model works perfectly well in the early stages of our project because we only have a small group of developers contributing to the projects. As more uh, developers and more teams get involved to contribute, uh, we quickly see the conflicts. And uh, one quick solution for us is to, we use the data level separations. So each developer use his own org data for testing. And uh, uh, we only right now, uh, at that point of time, we only have one environment and one pipeline. So every, everyone relies on to that pipelines. So we used, uh, at the beginning, we used uh, um, provided org data for each of the developers for their testings. And we really, uh, we quickly realized that uh, this is very inefficient ways because uh, developers ended up in the waiting lines. Even though we have, we use a different org level data, but uh, developers, have, developers have to wait for the next uh, batch run. And the current batch run could take uh, five or 10 or even longer. So it is easy for our developers to wait for a day to test the simple um, features or debug. Some developers uh, create uh, private jobs uh, in order to not to wait. But however, this job still point to our um, shared engagement data table. And if there are feature conflicts like a schema change, so this change will directly apply to the whole pipeline which will impact to other developers as well. So all these issues and the challenges make us to realize that we need a isolated application downtime context in a shared Databricks environment. Then we borrowed the concept of the namespace from Kubernetes and apply into our Delta uh, CICD pipeline. So the first, the application runtime context consists of the Delta Lake application or jobs themselves and all the dependent services. So our Delta applications rely on this following uh, services. First, we use the Kafka as a, for the structure streamings. We use Zookeeper to store our offsets and, uh, and also global synchronizations. And we use uh, AWS 3 for read and write URL files. We use the Delta table and we use the Sumologic for logging and data log for metrics. A namespace is just a given stream Provided, provided by data um, by developers who to define a scope of an application runtime context. So with uh, application development, um, it decorates all the artifacts created in those uh, dependent services and the application itself to create an isolated runtime context with a certain decoration rules. So for example, for Kafka topics, we, we decorate the namespace as a prefix of all those topics. And uh, so to the database name and for the data, database buckets, we also add this uh, namespace as part, as part of the prefix, S3 prefix. And we add this uh, namespace as part of the application name as well. The namespace can be passed through an environment variable or an or, or program arguments and is enforced with our um, in-house developed Spark framework. We call it AP Spark framework, Activity Platform Spark framework. And application context is consumed by all. Our Specifically, the application context normally reads the properties from uh, local property files, which has all the configurations. And with namespace, it will also read the namespace, try to read the namespace from environment or arguments and create a scope of properties with the decoration rules that will be consumed by our uh, dependent service modules and create a scoped objects. So to enable namespace deployment, the developers only need to specify a namespace as an environment variable. And optionally, he can pass a cluster ID uh, because the namespace deployment is usually used for testings. So if the developers have already have a cluster at hand, he can directly reuse it. Otherwise we will create it for them. 
So this is a one example of to use how to do the uh, namespace deployment. In this examples, we export the MVP namespace to equal to test underscore namespace, which means we want a names namespace deployment with the namespace value test underscore namespace. So after the deployments, first, you get a private uh, set of jobs that are decorated with this namespace, and you can easily identify them by searching uh, with namespace key. And second, you have your private database, Delta database, with the namespace decorated with, to, the, to, the old, uh, to the original um, database names. And the inside, this, uh, uh, inside the database, all the tables are private to the developers. And uh, the data file backed by the data table also has a private uh, SV uh, path so that uh, you can do whatever, you have a full control on, the, on your features and even it is very disruptive with a new, with a new schema and uh, there is no impact to others. And also you have a private um, Kafka topics for you to push the testing data to your Kafka topics. And uh, the offsets path in, in, in Zookeeper for that topic is also very private, it's private. So with a namespace development uh, deployment, we create a private deployment runtime context for developers in the shared Databricks VPCs. So it provides a private set of jobs, it provides a private delta tables and private streaming objects and a private log and matrix. So the immediate use case for namespace deployment is for local development. So with namespace developers specify their namespace and do the deployments with the one command and they can have a full control of that runtime context with any kind of changes. There's no conflicts at all. And the second use cases is we use it for performance benchmarking. In our second talk, we shared our bench, how we do our performance benchmarking for ID mutation use case in order to find the answer for the question of what will be the best value for the max, maximum file size. So we need a, a, a multiple set of our pipeline with the duplicate set of jobs and set of uh, data and set of the table schemas and tables, but with different configurations of max, max file size. So we just use the namespace deployment and uh, to specify the different namespace like a 4 MB, 8 MB to come up with the nine um, namespace deployments and uh, very easily. And the third use case for namespace de deployments is to do the integration testing. So that uh, uh, comes into the scenario based testing. So our pipeline uh, for the engagements or other type of um, activities start from simple to complex. So initially we only have one job in, for ingestion and one table for data table. And uh, later on, we add a second table notification table to support the incremental read. And later we add engagement ID mutation job to address multiple ID mutation cascading cases and handle the retry for disorderings and so on. And then we add the data retention for TTL request and we hooked the downstream jobs into the whole pipelines. So as we build more data lake, Delta Lake Spark applications to our pipelines on Databricks, we come up with a concept called scenario to effectively organize the applications and test cases. So a scenario is a group of relevant applications that collectively fulfill certain kind of functionalities and the tests uh, test cases are developed per scenario. And uh, this is a very simple uh, scenario specification. And we give uh, each of the scenario a specification in JSON. So the, the a scenario has a simple metadata, a name and a description, and has a run list. So the run list indicates the, the test logic you want to do in this scenario. So which follows the normal test logic. So in this example, uh, in the round list, in the first three, um, uh, are the, the first three jobs create engagement database and tables, cleanup tables, SAS welcome is to prepare the test bed. And uh, the create engagement test data is to generate the engagement test data, engagement data and uh, the mutation request for testing. 
And then we run the engagement ingestion. This is our actual uh, job for ingestion, which read those test data to our data table and the mutation record tables. And then also the mutation record notification ingestion is to ingest the mutation uh, requests. So this, after these two um, jobs, we will run the mutation record ingestion test. So this is a notebook to verify the results of the ingestions. And then after the ingestion is in place, we will run the engagement ID mutation, which has the actual our business logic for the mutation cases. Then after that, we run the ID mutation integration tests, which is a notebook to verify the actual um, mutation results. So with this uh, scenario, simple um, JSON specifications and uh, um, pass it into our CICD. So our CICD knows what is the scenario, scenario we want to run and uh, what is the jobs of this scenario need to be run in what sequence. So in this case, it's just this job we will run in, uh, in sequential execution sequence. So we have, we come up with a bunch of the scenarios um, definitions in JSON and put them up together with the um, Databricks job definition as a metadata. And uh, we pass this uh, uh, scenario definitions into our CICDs. Once we pass that, this tells our CICD so that we want to run the integration tests. This is the uh, example uh, output for, the, for our engagement projects. Then uh, uh, this is run as part of the build process. So you can see in the build process, when we pass those uh, parameters, the, engage, the scenario based testing is triggered. Then you will read those files and run the scenario one by one. So in this case, the first run ID mutation scenario. And second, we run the engagement data retention process scenario and followed by a name mutation scenario and so on. And this is another um, example for the voice insights um, data, lake, data lake. So similarly, it had, we come up with a group of scenarios for our sanity um, tests. So you notice that some of the scenario is, is small with, a couple, with just a few jobs and some of scenario are big with uh, more jobs. So the granularity of the scenarios really depends on what do you want to test and really depends on the developer's decisions. So with uh, scenario-based testing, we effectively organize the test for complex um, pipelines. And uh, they also serve as a solid sanity and regression testings, which give us the confidence that when we do the new features or the framework level changes, like the Spark 3 upgrade, we will not break our existing functionalities. Now I'll pass the board to Aaron to discuss the security and the access control. Um, Aaron, do you I, want to share? Can I yep. Can you stop sharing? Yeah, I stopped sharing. All right. Just want to make sure. Can you see my screen? Yep, your screen looks great. Okay. Is that mode? Yeah, okay. So thanks, Hang. And um, so now we have the entire pipeline you know, running, deployed, tested, and our system is in production. And obviously, you know, no system is perfect. At the end of the day, um, you know, issues will come up. And when issues happen, we, we want the uh, on-call engineers or you know, the support people to be able to do effective debugging and troubleshooting. And at Salesforce, trust is our number one value, meaning nothing is more important than the trust of our customers and all our stakeholders. And trust here refers to being able to protect the customer's data, making sure that um, there's no tampering that happens um, and that access is extremely limited. So keep this in mind while I go through. Uh, so the goal here is we want to be able to have a mechanism that's low friction. Uh, you know, obviously nobody likes going into production and you know go and have to go through tons of hoops in order to you know do your debugging. Uh, as I mentioned, we want to prevent data tampering. Uh, we want the operations to be predefined, meaning uh, we don't want users to be able to go in and randomly do some ad hoc queries like you know, drop table. Blah. I'm sure we've seen stories like that. 
and it finally needs to be approved by the Salesforce security team. So the initial idea that we came up with was to have read-only notebooks uh, that's integrated as part of our CI/CD pipeline that you know Hang was talking about. Um, so how this read-only notebooks work is that we actually have a dedicated interactive cluster that's only specifically used for the notebooks. And the access for most users on those clusters is limited to can run. Um, they can't like you know, stop, start, or what, I mean, they can't, yeah, they can't do other stuff on, on the clusters. And to help us uh, enforce the um, predefined access requirement, meaning no ad hoc queries, we actually use the Databricks widgets to pass in parameters. So here is an example. So we have a dedicated interactive cluster called foundation debugging over here. Um, it's created as part of um, the um, SRE infra provisioning. And all users into the system will only be able to you know, run the cluster, not manage it. And we have, at the top over here, um, we have the widgets. And in order to set up the widgets, we actually you know, just create a command, um, the API and, and stuff is listed in the previous slide. And it's all that's available online. So when users come in over here, they'll just you know, select whatever database they want, the format of any output. You know, we use Avro over here um, as part of the final transformation step. Um, it's also like Parquet or whatever. And then the S3 path where the data is stored, what fields you're gonna select on the Delta table, the table that you're gonna select, uh, the time if you want, um, where we can actually filter and you know, any additional where clauses. So we actually have a separate command uh, to query the table. So we, we even incorporate in time travel if you need to say, okay, I want to know what the state of this table is five days ago when the customer actually had the issue. Because you know, it takes time from the time the customer case is created to the time uh, support triages it until you know, R&D actually gets it. So time travel is actually pretty heavily used for troubleshooting. And um, occasionally, maybe you might encounter performance issues in uh, production where, uh, where we actually don't meet the SLAs for whatever reason. So in that sense, uh, we actually have uh, the ability to do profiling in production as well. Obviously, it's you know, read-only as usual. And this is one example over here. So as part of this predefined notebook, uh, there's a read-only command which allows us to uh, retrieve the um, the number of files in a certain bucket. So over here is an example where you know you have the breakdown of all the files. Obviously, uh, there's most of the files fall into the under 500k um, uh, what do you call it bucket. But I mean, this is all good. It's extremely user friendly and it's very low friction. It kind of meets all our criteria except the last one, which is the security approval. Um, and there are three issues. The first is that the out of box audit logging uh, that's provided by Databricks, it's really rich, but it um, lacks one key feature, which is um, as part of the notebook widget, uh, it, doesn't log, it, it doesn't log the input parameters uh, that the user you know, actually uses. So that's, uh, something that didn't sit quite well with uh, security. Uh, the second issue is that users actually have to physically log in to uh, the database portal and use the UI and everything. And that requires user building. Um, we, we kind of wanted to avoid that because you know, users come and go um, in, in Salesforce all the time. And it is a lot of overhead. And the last thing, which is, I guess, the, the biggest thing um, is that they're actually insufficient. Groups. So we need something stronger than just simply SSO or a username password login. So what we did is uh, we actually came up with a second version, which actually leverages the Databricks API, which incidentally is used by our CICD pipeline as well. So as part of the API, we have, you know, uh, Databricks provides mechanisms to start the clusters and actually invoke commands. 
um, the, invo the, the command API is part of that older API, it's the 1.2 uh, version, but it's still supported. And it, after analyzing and doing some you know, uh, spiking, we actually found that it uh, would meet our need and we are able to actually build it. Uh, so we're actually able to build a wrapper API service within our own Salesforce infrastructure, uh, which would meet, which, you know, take all the boxes. So this is actually a very high level, simple uh, deployment structure that we have. So on the left side over here is the box where the Salesforce so-called core infrastructure lives. Um, there is actually a secure user access portal where engineers like myself, um, in order to access it, first we need to have a, a legit customer, customer case open. And uh, in addition to you know, your usual uh, username, password, uh, two-factor authentication, um, you need an additional UDT access. So it's part of our typical production debugging, um, uh, what do you call it, workflow. So that um, infra is able to actually talk uh, using a trusted net network layer using MTLS to an ingress gateway that's, uh, that we host on a separate uh, infra. And the ingress gateway goes through our API gateway, which we use uh, Zool proxy. And it generates an internal job, which then calls a service, internal service, uh, which basically just wraps the Databricks API so that we can invoke all the Databricks commands. Now, invoking the Databricks API requires an access token that you know, was also mentioned by Hang uh, earlier. In this case, we actually have a, a single user provision on Databricks specifically for this debugging purpose. And as part of that, we generate the access token and store it in the HashiCorp vault. So the API would retrieve the token from vault and you know, invoke whatever APIs that are needed for the uh, production debugging tool. So yeah, this is pretty much what, what I talked about. So we have a secure access portal, um, which requires both SSO and UBT, it requires an open customer case, and uh, it provides full audit trail logging. So whatever input that the user you know, puts in, say they want to select field ABC from engagement, from table XYZ, uh, all that is logged out of the box. And only one account is needed to be provisioned. And we actually have a separate uh, token rotation uh, job, which frequently rotates the access token so that, you know, in case for whatever reason, some breach or leak, the token is rotated. And everything here is fully predefined and there's no uh, available, there's no way someone can actually run ad hoc queries and, you know, do like SQL injection or whatever. So the, the basic workflow is, um, a user will go in, start the cluster, they'll check whether the cluster is started, and then they'll create an execution context. Uh, the execution context actually is similar to what you see in the notebook command box kind of thing. And then you can create a command and basically you just wait for the results. So uh, this is pretty much how it looks like. Obviously this is not a real production use case, um, but this is, the UI from our secure user access portal, which we should call Black Tap. And uh, you can select the command, uh, sorry, select the operation type. In this case, uh, we're retrieving the status of the command, the cluster word that we want to run, uh, which, is, which can be pre-populated. And then the command and the context ID, which uh, are provided to you when you actually trigger the actions. And uh, this will be the output of the status, uh, the output of the actual command, which is, pretty much exactly the same as what you see in the notebooks. So that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you so much for you know, the time and listening to, the, to this talk. So we have all the uh, previous um, sessions, blog and videos, and please feel free to take a look. Thank you.
Awesome. Thanks very much. This was super interesting. Um, Hang and Aaron, I really appreciate you taking the time to provide this awesome information. We've got about 10 minutes or so left, so that, and there's a bunch of questions. So let me try to tackle some of the most um, recent ones that just came through on the pike. Um, if you do have some more questions, by all means, please go ahead and continue chiming in. Um, I've actually asked some questions back to the folks, at least who are asking questions on LinkedIn right now, uh, just for some clarifying questions. But um, Craig, why don't you start off with the first set of questions and we'll just go from there. How's that? Well, it sounds good. Um, let's see. So we did have a question from Evan uh, asking about you know, whether you can use uh, an interactive Azure Databricks cluster for batch ingestion into Delta Lake and which, which the ideal uh, cluster setup be for that. Um, so uh, in this case, it, it, it doesn't matter if you're using like which cloud provider uh, you're using Databricks on, but um, in this case, you can absolutely use uh, an interactive cluster for batch ingestion. Um, now, uh, the second part of the question talking about the ideal cluster setup, I think that's a little more, it's not nuanced, but I think there, there are a couple different dimensions to consider. So first would be the actual cluster configuration itself. Right. So by cluster configuration, I mean uh, what node types, how many nodes, uh, and that's specifically going to be highly dependent on your own workload. So that's something you'll need to test. Um, but uh, in the, the other dimension that you might, well, you want to consider in this case is uh, let's call it the cluster execution model on Databricks. So in Databricks, generally there are two types of clusters that you can create. One is an interactive cluster where uh, you're, you're creating it uh, to you know, be always on to do interactive work on whether it's development or uh, running queries, things of that nature. Um, and the other would be a, uh, a jobs cluster, which is uh, a cluster that uh, a Databricks job creates um, for, uh, for each specific run. So this is an ephemeral cluster that only uh, exists for the duration of that job. Um, and so for this batch ingestion use case, I think the, the best way to think about which, which type of Databricks cluster to use is um, to understand where you are in the development cycle. So um, if you're if you're just uh, testing out this uh, this new use case and you're just, you're developing code, you're you're testing to see uh, you know how you want to optimize it and things like that, you should absolutely use an interactive cluster. Once you go into production, however, uh, that's where you'll want to uh, to convert convert that into a job. Uh, and the reason you want to do this is for you know a couple of different reasons. So um, you know let, let's say that. Uh, you you need this job absolutely to succeed every hour. Then you might you might want to select on demand uh, nodes only. So you'll want to configure that. Um, you'll want isolation for those jobs so that there's no resource contention to potentially slow it down with with other queries running on that same cluster. Uh, and the last and probably most important consideration is uh, job job clusters are much cheaper. And so once once you're in production, it really behooves you to move from interactive uh, to jobs. Um, so and. And I, I think to what Aaron was sharing, um, if you're debugging the, the job or, or, or you're needing to uh, investigate, that's where you'll want to potentially spin up an interactive cluster again. So, um, you know, it's, it's that, that, that was a lot of information, but that's the way that we want, you know, Databricks users to think about how you'd want to, you know, create or tune your cluster. Cool, excellent context, Craig. Uh, by the way, before I, uh, Aaron, I'm going to ask you the next question. It's actually a, a pullback from the the one of the first sessions about in the engagement activity Delta Lake. Um, but the context, I, I, I did want to call out. There was a question from YouTube considering uh, are the slides and presentations going to be available? Yes, they're going to be propped right here into YouTube. Since you're on YouTube, then they're going to be propped right there. In addition to that, we're also putting them into the Delta.io link that I'm actually going to send to you. Uh, everybody on LinkedIn and YouTube as well, uh, and Zoom. Uh, so that way you have the, uh, the, the series actually all there. Um, saying that, uh, back to you, Aaron. Um, again, this is referring to the engagement activity Delta Lake, the one of the first sessions of the series. Um, is the downstream data pulled from the engagement activity Delta Lake, is that done in real time or is that done in microbatch? It's actually microbatch. It's not really real time. Uh, so the Downstream consumers actually pull from the uh, Delta Lake once currently, once every four hours, that obviously talks to in increase or uh, decrease that time. And, uh, you know, so it runs, triggers once, 
once every four hours. And but switching to real time, we've actually tested it. It works fine. It, we our, our pipeline tool we scale. Yeah. Excellent, Eric. Thanks very much. Uh, hey, Craig, do you mind chance have another question that we can pull up from here? Yeah, let's see. Uh, let me take a quick look. Um, let's see. So we do have a couple of uh, questions that uh, you know maybe aren't super pertinent to to our um, our current talk. Uh, let me see. Maybe you can just address it real quick. Um, so, okay, so we, we have a question about uh, utilizing um, cloud files <laughs> uh, with ADLS Gen 2. Um, I think maybe just to, well, to, to address it briefly, um, yes, like cloud files is what you'd want to use if you have a file source. Um, rather than using the uh, default file source in structured streaming, uh, we, we do highly recommend that you move to cloud files so that you're not having to spend a lot of time listing uh, the object storage. Uh, instead, you can do it on a notification basis. So it just makes it much, much more efficient, especially if you have millions of files per day. So um, in this case, yes, absolutely use autoloader. So. Sure. And actually, one thing I'll add to Craig's call out. So specifically, it's about, uh, I believe the question was from uh, Reda, uh, I believe, uh, and from LinkedIn. And he was asking the context of 2 million JSON files a day to insert uh, or update a Delta table. And is, is autoloader a good idea? So underneath the covers, basically the way autoloader works is that there is a RocksDB uh, frame that actually keeps track of all of the files that are being processed. There's actually multiple threads that will go ahead and fetch and delete. So that way you don't actually have to do constant cloud file listings. The cloud file listings basically makes things really, really significantly slow. Okay, so every time you hit a cloud object store and you ask for all of the data, that becomes a very slow process, right? And so nobody really wants to deal with it, especially if you're constantly rereading that full list. Even if that list was fast, which it is not, just to overemphasize that point again, right? You, you're not gonna know necessarily which files were processed and which files weren't. So when you're talking about millions of JSON files, that's exactly what you're worried about. So what Alloader does is basically takes the, uh, instead of actually taking the list of files, it'll actually make use of cloud file storage's event notifications. So basically uh, with Azure, it'll be um, Azure Q storage, I believe, and with AWS, it's um, event notifications and the SQ, uh, that goes into the SQS queue. Okay, so what ends up happening is that information, that file, anytime a new file gets placed in the cloud object storage, that information shows up in the queue. So from that queue, any process that we're taking on from with autoloader can go ahead and say, okay, wait, there's a new file based on the notification that I just received. We chuck it to the rocks DB so that way we can figure out if we're processing it or not, if we need to process it or not. Because we've already loaded that information into a very high performance load latency store, this allows us to figure out, hey, if you have a duplication, because don't forget, uh, those queues have exact, uh, at least once semantics. In other words, you'll get notified of the file at least once. But how about if you get notified of the file about five times, <laughs> right? Well, that's the whole point. You don't want to do that. So you want to ensure you're not be running into uh, duplications of the files. So having that RocksDB store actually allows us to figure that out. And so we can figure out, yes, we processed it. No, we have not. Okay, grab the file and continue processing it. Chuck it to structured theming and it's on its merry way. And so that's the context underneath the cover. So that's why we're saying, yeah, yeah, actually autoloader is a very powerful mechanism to process that data. So hopefully that provides some additional uh, context around that. Cool, all right, uh, let's go back to the fun stuff though on, on this particular session, okay? Um, there's actually a pretty uh, good uh, question referring to actually boost the second session, boosting Delta Lake performance, right? And for specifically, there was a question around why, uh, I believe this is for either Aaron or for Hank, why do your IDs in this case mutate? Why not just having a mapping table to coordinate all that information? Because for some folks, and the reason I think they ask the question is because the idea is that, you know, like you could always just create a large uh, mapping table that to track all the IDs and the new IDs, like a primary key, circuit key, if you want to almost think of it that way. So instead, 
why do you have the mutate instead uh, in times in terms of your design? Oh, that's okay. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron, go go ahead. No, no, no you, you can answer it because I answered this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the reason is that uh, we are also a downstream to upstreams and uh, upstream is our um, core Salesforce applications. And uh, by design, they will, um, when the ownership of the engagement changes, then uh, it will trigger the IDs of the ownership to change. And it will also trigger all the engagement IDs to, tri to trigger that belongs to this, uh, belongs to these owners. So this is which to simply put that is the, this is out of control and uh, this is controlled by upstreams and we have follow we have to follow that rules and so that there's no way for us to use a, a mapping table to map the uh, engagement and the owner IDs so we have to uh, perform the ID mutations that follow the upstreams. Aaron, you have anything to add? Mm, no, and also the, yeah, I mean, it's mostly an upstream issue. <laughs> yeah, because uh, these are like records that already exist in the, you know, course, uh, Salesforce CRM uh, world and database. So it's not like, you know, we can do anything about it. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, this may or may not be our, our last question, but um, we did have uh, uh, a good question uh, from the, the previous session, uh, global synchronization and ordering in Delta Lake. Um, I think uh, Leo might be uh, the right person to answer this. Um, so uh, Anurag Sharma asked, uh, how do you handle uh, late arriving data? Um, and you know, what are the limits of, of how you handle that late arriving data, if any? So this question for me, okay. Yep. Um, so for late arriving data, I think like in our application, so, so in, in our case, the, uh, it's the, like the mutation events arrive earlier than our actual like the ingestion data. So if that happens, we are going to uh, like, because the data, the, the actual ingestion data is not in the table, we are going to detect it. And then we know, okay, this is, in, this is the like early arrival mutation data. So we are going to keep those data and then in the retry table, and then we are going to do like retries until like we reach like the, the maximum number of retries. Yeah, that's how we handle uh, the, uh, the layer of data in, in our case. I think this is the only case that we have. And, and then also like how many times you retry just depends on like, um, it all depends on your applications. Like what, what is the time coverage um, for the retry, yeah. Awesome, thanks for that. Perfect, uh, thank you very much. This has been a great session. I realize we have a lot more other questions, but we do need to close it up. So, um, so here's my ask for everybody. Basically, number one, I wanna say thank you very much to Hang, uh, Aaron and Yifang for this wonderful session. Uh, also to Zizong, he's not here right now, but uh, we definitely want to thank him. I uh, want to thank Craig and uh, Chris Fish, who was here for a while, to, for answering questions. Karen, of course, you've been leading us through this entire thing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure you have other questions. So here's what I ask. We'll ask all of you. Go to Delta.io. Uh, join us on our Delta user Slack. We are very, very active there. And so we're constantly answering questions um, there, whether it's your Delta OSS questions or the, your Delta Databricks questions, actually. So please join us there because we're very we're very reactive there and we try to provide context uh, as much as we can. So I think that's about it. Karen, uh, why don't you close up shop for us? Sure, thanks so much, Denny. Yeah, we'd love for everyone to, to get involved. Uh, Denny uh, put the... Uh, delta.io slack link or sorry delta.io link uh, to the tech talk series so that's what i was going to point to is um, all the four talks of the series are available online uh, so we hope you'll hope you'll check those out and so thanks thanks everyone again from salesforce and craig and chris uh, for this awesome session and thanks everyone for joining us so hope you all have a great rest of your day thanks so much take care